Good day and welcome to today's webinar on CAM to CNC. My name is Arthur van Weingaard and I'm one of the applications engineer from the Moderna OneSolve team. Looking at the agenda for today's webinar, we'll go through the benefits of the machining extension, the steep and shallow 3 axis, the steep and shallow 5 axis, the flow 5 axis, the whole recognition option, change tools option, moving entry positions, and then afterwards we'll have a Q&A. We will answer any of the questions that you might have. Let's have a look at some of the benefits that is included with the Fusion 360 machining extension. Some of the benefits from the machining extension simplify and automate your CAM programming it reduces cycle times and you produce better quality parts. A subscription to Fusion 360 opens the door to a vast array of design, simulation and manufacturing capabilities to help your business thrive. So what happens when your business grows? Well, Fusion 360 can grow with you with a range of cost-effective Fusion 360 extensions which can help meet your growing business needs. Unlike APIs, plugins, add-ins, and apps available from the Autodesk App Store, Fusion 360 extensions unlock more advanced design and manufacturing technology which is fully integrated into the Fusion 360 environment. To help discover new designs that reduce weight, increase structural integrity, and extend durability, there's the Generative Design extension, which harnesses the power of machine learning and artificial intelligence letting you explore unlimited ideas which are optimized for specific materials and manufacturing techniques. To boost the CNC machining capabilities of Fusion 360, the machining extension unlocks more advanced 3 and 5 axis CNC machining capabilities, including automated hole drilling and surface finishing techniques, 5 axis collision avoidance, in cycle probing, and more. And to support the use of metal powder bed fusion machines for additive manufacturing, there's the Additive Build extension, which lets you automatically orient parts and build support structures, as well as generate and visualize additive toolpaths for these machines. Fusion 360 extension access is flexible. Each extension can be purchased individually or together, either inside Fusion 360 itself, via the eStore, or from your salesperson. eStore purchases can be made with a range of payment options, with an additional option to use Autodesk Cloud Credits from within Fusion 360. And because it's flexible, access can be on a yearly subscription or shorter terms such as on a monthly basis, letting you add or remove more users if your business demands change throughout the year. So whether you want to increase your design productivity, boost your machining capability, or print high value metal additive parts, Fusion 360 extensions will give you the advanced technology and flexible access you require today as well as continuing to grow to meet your business needs in the future. Users can now machine undercut regions in three axes when using a steep and shallow toolpath with tools capable of cutting upper profiles. This improvement will save you plenty of programming and machining time, as it will minimize the number of setups needed for your finishing operations. Let's look into this in more detail. Looking at the part on my screen, you can see that if I run the Accessibility Analysis tool, there are areas that I wouldn't be able to reach with a straight-sided tool in a 3-axis configuration. This improvement allows you to use steep and shallow to machine undercuts in 3-axis with lollipop, disc, barrel, or dovetail cutters. Let's look at the example on my screen. In the Tool tab, I selected my lollipop tool. In the Geometry tab, I selected this area, adding 2 mm of additional offset. Moving on to the Passes tab, I need to remember to set my threshold angle to 0 degrees. This will make the Machine Undercuts checkbox appear. Lastly, I want to make sure that in the Tool Axis tab, my primary Tool Axis mode is set to Vertical and I don't have Collision Avoidance active to ensure the toolpath will be output in 3 axes. I can now simulate the toolpath to see my tool machine in the side wall of my part, including the undercuts. One last thing before concluding. If before running your stock simulation you'd like to see what areas are accessible by the active tool, 
You can use the new Draw Tool on Cursor functionality, activating it from the navigation bar or using the shortcut Ctrl T. This way, you can save valuable programming time by avoiding calculating toolpaths unnecessarily. Hopefully, this video is a good starting point for you to understand how to use this new functionality. Users can now machine the entirety of the steep areas of their parts, including any undercut regions, when using a steep and shallow toolpath. This improvement will save you plenty of programming and machining time, as it will minimize the number of setups needed for your finishing operations. Let's look into this in more detail. Looking at the part on my screen, you can see that if I run the Accessibility Analysis tool, there are areas that I would not be able to reach with a straight-sided tool in a three-axis configuration. In this video, we'll see how to tackle this issue assuming my machine has five-axis capabilities. In the Tool tab, I'm going to select a 6mm ball nose. Then choose a shaft and holder mode, ideally pull away or trimmed in this case. In the Geometry tab, when selecting the machining boundary, I need to make sure that the selected chain includes all the areas I aim to machine with the chosen toolpath. I can then move on to the Passes tab. Here I need to remember to set my threshold angle to 0 degrees, as this will make the Machine Undercuts checkbox appear. Finally, in the Tool Axis tab, I can choose my primary Tool Axis mode, from Point in this case, and select my Guiding Point. Please note that you will need to sketch your guiding points or curves in the design workspace. If I now simulate this toolpath, you can see that my tool machines all the steep areas within the chosen region, including any undercut areas. Hopefully this video is a good starting point for you to understand how to use this new functionality. Let's now look at how to use multi-axis operations with Flow. As before, Select the required surfaces on top of the mouse and change their vector directions accordingly. In the Multi-Axis tab, check the Use Multi-Axis button. Tilt parameters can now be defined to give the tool the option to tilt around the Z-axis. Forward tilt is defined in two ways. A lead angle is where the tool is tilted towards the direction of cut. Conversely, a lag angle is when the tool is tilted away from the direction of cut. Sideways Tilt will tilt the tool around the direction of cut. Entering a minimum tilt will always mean the tool is tilted, whilst maximum tilt defines the limit of the tool either side of vertical. Simulating this, we notice that although the tool has full freedom to tilt, the ball end mill is cutting the part normal to the surface with the tip of the tool for an entirety of the cut. As the tip of the tool has almost zero surface speed, the tool will leave a dull and poor quality surface finish. To fix this, let's add a side tilt of 25 degrees and limit the toolpath to 45 degrees either side of the vertical. Simulating again, the toolpath shows a smooth, simultaneous multi-axis toolpath with the tool cutting on its side ensuring a smooth and even surface quality finish. The axis can also be displayed to show how the tool will be orientated at each point while cutting is denoted by a yellow line. Let's also quickly have a look at how the toolpath points are distributed. Clicking the Show Points button, we can see an even distribution. Let's now compare that to the parallel strategy, where although the cutter paths look suitable, the point distributions are not nearly as evenly spaced. Having evenly distributed points means a smoother machine axis motion and leads ultimately to a better surface finish. Here we have a component which has nearly 200 holes. As with many components, the holes are organized into various groups with each group designed to cater for different uses. Some are tapped, some are H7 fits, some are clearance fits and so on. One way to tackle this in Fusion 360 would be to manually select the holes we want choose a tool from our library and choose the appropriate settings and then apply the parameters. But when we're dealing with a lot of holes, this can become a tedious process. So to speed up this process, we can use hole recognition to automate some of these steps to detect holes in both our primary axes and holes in other axes. 
in as few clicks as possible to achieve the results we want. Hole recognition can be as easy as selecting it, choosing our hole signatures and selecting OK. Whilst this is a viable option, to give us toolpaths for all of our holes, we're going to spend a little bit more time going through all of the options to see how we can set it up for optimum results. The first step in the workflow is to identify the tools needed to create the holes. For instance, to create an M6 tapped hole, we need a 5mm drill and an M6 tap. We can either create our own tools, use our personal libraries, import third party libraries, or we can use the Fusion 360 sample libraries. Fusion 360 sample libraries contain hundreds of different imperial and metric tools for free. For this example, we'll choose the third option and import a tool library. Once the tools are imported, we can use these for our hole recognition, completing this stage of the workflow. Next, we'll look at hole templates and what role they play in hole recognition. We have what we know as hole signatures. Hole signatures are the geometry which Fusion recognises. These are the basic 3D shapes like cones, cylinders and flats which make up different types of holes. One example of this would be two cylinders connected. The one at the top being larger than the one at the bottom, connected by flat geometry. This would tell Fusion the signature is a counterbore. Hole templates are the toolpaths needed to create that specific signature. Going back to the counterbore example, we may need a spot drill, a deep drill and finally a 2D bore operation all in sequence to create this geometry. For the more conventional hole signatures in this part, like a blind tapped hole, I already have a hole template because I've machined this type of hole before using hole recognition. So you can see I already have templates for the tapped holes, the counterboard clearance holes, the reamed blind holes and the reamed through holes. I just need to create the template for the counterboard reamed hole as this isn't a hole signature I've came across before. To create the hole template, I want to create my four operations here which I've made manually. These four operations are spot drilling, drilling, reaming and a 2D bore operation, as these are the operations necessary to create this hole signature. To create the template, select the operations, right click and store as hole template. I will name the whole template accordingly, then either save it in a local library or a cloud library. We also have the option to import templates. We simply go into the templates library, import, then select the template we want to bring into Fusion 360. Now we've done all the necessary pre-work. We can click on the whole recognition command and we'll get this dialogue. What we see here in the first tab is whole groups. These are the whole signatures which have been identified on our primary axis. You can see hole recognition has detected six hole groups. All of the holes on this plane have been identified. We now need to determine the action. This is where our hole templates from earlier come into play. We have our pre-made templates which are automatically defined within Fusion 360. Then we have our custom templates. Fusion 360 will intelligently figure out which holes require which template from the geometry. If Fusion 360 doesn't choose correctly, it's very simple for us to expand the drop down list and pick which hole template is correct for this hole. Once we've done this, we move into the second tab, which allows us to pick the tool library in which we want to choose our tools from. We can use any of our personal libraries. We can use the sample tools which come pre-made with Fusion 360 or a library we've imported. In this case, I already have the machines tool library which I imported earlier. So I'm going to have this selected and nothing else. This will ensure when Fusion 360 picks the tools for the drilling toolpaths, it's only using the tools which we want and already have set up inside of this library, eliminating the need for more work in creating tools later on. In the final tab, there's a few more options we can define to tweak and optimize hole recognition. The first one we see is limit to the setup plane. This allows hole recognition to identify holes which aren't on the primary axis. This allows us to do multi-axis drilling. If we untick this option, then go back to hole groups, you'll see more hole signatures are available to us. It's now identified all the holes in the component, regardless of what axis they live on. Inevitably, we'll have certain constraints on our machine, such as a machine table which only rotates a certain amount. 
We can limit hold recognition by angle with the minimum and maximum angle. This can be a very powerful tool for selecting the hole signatures you want to machine. For example, I could change my minimum angle to one degree, ignoring all the holes which are on the primary axis and machining all the hole signatures which aren't on the primary axis. We also have the option to find by diameter. Here we can set a maximum diameter size if there's certain holes we don't want hole recognition to pick up. For example, if we had a 100mm bore in our part, the chances are we probably want to machine this bore another way. In this case, hole recognition will ignore it. We have two options to optimise hole recognition. The first is minimise tool changes. If the same tool can be used on two different groups, these groups will be output consecutively to reduce the number of tool changes needed. Group by size means if a hole requires multiple operations, all the operations will be grouped together. Finally, we have use fewest spot drills possible. With this option ticked, hole recognition will use as few spot drills as it can on the spot drilling operations, saving unnecessary tool changes. And that's how we can use hole recognition in conjunction with the tool library and hole templates to automate drilling in the primary axis and multi-axis. It can sometimes be very difficult to select the right length of tool for the program toolpath at hand. Traditionally, one would consider always using the shortest tool wherever possible, but problems could arise with either the tool, holder, or both colliding with the part in different areas. Longer tools often help to reduce tool and holder collisions, but often results in more tool deflection and vibration, which can lead to the part being damaged or worse, being scrapped. Here, I have my shortest tool available. However, we can clearly see a collision with the holder. Using the new change tool functionality, I can quickly change the tool for a same diameter tool with a different holder without having to recalculate the toolpath. Again, even though I've changed the tool in this instance, I am still getting a collision with the tool. I can now make further adjustments to the overall length of the tool, which means my tool will reach the full depth for the required toolpath, with the benefit of not having to recalculate that same toolpath. In this next instance, I have a mold tool on screen with some deep areas to machine. I've used a steep and shallow strategy to machine both areas of the sloped faces as highlighted in blue. Simulating the toolpath shows that with my current tool, I have the holder colliding with the part in four key areas. Here, 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 and here. To avoid the collisions with the holder, I want to machine those areas with a separate longer tool whilst maintaining the original shorter tool for the shallower areas. To do this, I can use the trim toolpath option and create a polygon around the area. Using the keep both option, I can make sure that the toolpath is split into its individual entities. Using the change tool button in the ribbon or the right mouse button to modify the split segment, I can now change the tool and select a tool which is longer and won't cause a collision with my holder. Simulating the toolpath now shows the collision with the holder has been removed. In this next toolpath, we can see that the toolpath is split into four key areas. The problem here is that I have multiple tool changes across these areas, which I would like to minimize. Using the simple drag and drop functionality, I can now reorder the toolpath to reduce any unnecessary tool changes, which would result in my program becoming more efficient. Users will now have the possibility to move the entry positions of any toolpath with close passes. There are a few toolpaths that already have the option to specify ideal entry points within the linking tab, but there are many others that don't give users this possibility. 
Also, in some cases it's preferable to visualize which entry points need to be moved and then proceed to edit them, rather than trying to imagine how the toolpath will look like. That's why this is now available as a toolpath modification. There are several reasons why you may want to edit the point where your tool engages the part. For example, it's quite common for tools to leave a small mark on the part by the entry and exit positions, moving these points, and therefore the marks, to a place where they're less important could be a beneficial choice. In addition, moving the entry positions of your toolpath towards areas where there isn't a big amount of excess stock left can make a massive difference on tool life by reducing shock loading. Lastly, in toolpaths that machine undercut regions, it may be beneficial to move the entry positions to an area where the tool has safer and easier access to the overhangs. Let's now see how to use this option using the part on my screen. First, let's select a calculated toolpath. We can now choose Move Entry Positions under the Modify section of the ribbon. As you can see, the menu is quite simple. All you need to do is sketch a line or multiple lines that intersect the toolpath passes where you want your new entry positions to be. You can do this on as many passes as needed. In this case, I wanted to move my entry positions away from any corners. As you can see, when I sketch my lines, Fusion 360 will provide me with a visual preview of the new start points. If I now click on OK, we can take a look at the updated toolpath and confirm that all the desired positions have been updated. One of the greatest benefits of all toolpath modifications within Fusion 360 is that your strategies will not need to be entirely regenerated. This means you'll be saving plenty of programming time, as only the leads and links impacted by the edits will have to be recomputed. As always, you can view, edit and delete the toolpath modification by right-clicking on the respective icon in the toolpath edits history bar. Please keep in mind that, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, you can only edit the entry positions of toolpaths that contain closed passes. We have come to the end of our webinar. Thank you all for joining in, and we will be moving on to the Q&A section where we will answer any of the questions that you might have. Thank you for coming, and we hope to see you again soon.